Good evening, everybody. Oh, I know we've got an excited crowd when even I get applause walking onto the stage. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Edward Wolcher. I am the curator of lectures here at Town Hall Seattle. And on behalf of Town Hall and our partners tonight at the Elliott Bay Book Company, who you saw in the lobby as you came in, I am so pleased to welcome you to tonight's appearance by hometown hero, journalist, author, and speaker, Ijeoma Oluo. <laughs> She's going to be joined in conversation tonight by uh, the, our great f philosopher in Alt Weekly Residence in Seattle, Charles Mudede, uh, for a unique conversation. I'm really, really excited. This hometown show, this is sort of like a homecoming uh, leg of a, of a year and a half long book tour for this book. Um, and I'm really excited for this audience to be part of it tonight. Uh, a couple announcements about Town Hall. First of all, I do want to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish tribe. We thank them for their hospitality and the continuing use of the ancestral uh, resources of their homeland. So the format tonight is going to be an onstage conversation. Should be about 45 minutes to an hour um, with Ijeoma and Charles, after which we will try and open it to as many questions as we can get to. Uh, when we get to Q&A, there will be microphones on either side of the stage. Please line up um, to use those microphones. And I implore you to keep your questions brief and in the form of a question so we can get through as many as possible. <laughs> I also encourage uh, especially white men to maybe slow down their enthusiasm for jumping on the microphones <laughs> on an event like this tonight. Um, and uh, encourage other folks to feel confident running up. Okay. Uh, and then after all of that, there will be a book signing. Copies of So You Want to Talk About Race are available at the Elliott Bay table in the lobby. Uh, you can pick those up and we will be signing afterwards. Okay. Now to the main event. Ijeoma Oluo is a Seattle-based writer, speaker, and internet yeller. She has been named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans in 2017, one of the most influential people in Seattle by Seattle Magazine, and one of the 50 most influential women in Seattle by Seattle Met. And she is the winner of the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award by the American Humanist Society. <laughs> Olua's work focuses primarily on issues of race and identity, feminism, social and mental health, social justice, the arts, and personal essay. Her writing, excuse me, has been featured in the Washington Post, NBC News, Elle Magazine, Time, The Stranger, and The Guardian, amongst many other outlets. As I said, she will be joined on stage tonight by Charles Mudede. Charles is a Zimbabwean-born, a Seattle-based writer, filmmaker, and cultural critic, and associate editor for The Stranger, as well as a lecturer in English Humanities at PLU. Uh, he's the author of the 2003 short book, Last Scene with Diana George, and uh, the um, filmmaker of films such as Zoo and Police Beat. His work appears in many uh, outlets, including, of course, The Stranger, as well as The New York Times, The Village Voice, LA Weekly, and Sea Theory. But they're here tonight to talk about Ijeoma's New York Times best-selling book, So You Want to Talk About Race. Please join me in giving a warm town hall welcome to Ijeoma Oluo and Charles Mudede. goodness. I'm going to be bad about this. Um, everybody, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm not going to hide the fact that I'm a touch nervous, um, only because there's so much stuff to cover and talk about. Um, I want to first bring out that um, when we were in the back, um, Ijeoma informed me that the paperback that she's now um, um, promoting is uh, number seven. Four. Four. Sorry. Four. <laughs> Four on the bestseller list <laughs> today. Sorry, seven would be me <laughs> <laughs> if that happened. But I, uh, <laughs> you know, 
But no, it's a really, really, really significant achievement. And it's interesting because the book was written two years ago, mm-hmm. or at least it was published two years ago, and um, it's still very relevant in, um, even after um, uh, all of these rapid changes in our culture, not rapid changes that are fundamental, but the fact that so much of the discourse that was happening when the book was written um, um, has now been um, altered by recent events. I mean, just to give an example, um, Trump wasn't president (laughs) when you wrote this book. And I actually wanted to ask you about that. I mean, what did it mean? I mean, you obviously, Trump is all over the book. In a, in a quiet way, not in a quiet way, in an obvious way, and yet um, when, and now it's like, oh yeah, here we are. Yeah, it's been weird. Um, you know, I wrote the book, I mean, of course, I started the book in 2015, mm-hmm. so Trump was still kind of an oddity, right? Like, we knew he was racist, but... <laughs> Um, the chances, you know, at that time, people were still thinking, mm, you know, when I started really d- diving into writing. And I turned the book in shortly before the election results. And I remember the next morning being like, oh, this is the worst job security ever. Like, this is not... <laughs> how I wanted to secure writing gigs. Um, (laughs) And I think there was this kind of overall panic. Someone asked me in an interview if I thought that the book would have sold as well if Trump hadn't been president. And I can say no. Um, It was just as necessary before, obviously. Right. Um, (laughs) But it was like election day happened and all of a sudden white people were messaging me, going, what went wrong? (laughs) We have a problem. (laughs) And, you know, we're like, is there a book? You know, is there... (laughs) And, And it's just been, it's been interesting to see how so many of the things that I think that we've been writing and talking about black writers and scholars um, have been talking about for hundreds of years, are just now being so blatantly obvious for the first time, I think, in our generation, that people are going, hmm, maybe there is something to worry about with this whole racism thing. Maybe I need to look into this. Um, And so at first, I think there was like this real panic that drove people to the book. Now, Mm -hmm. I think it's more utility. I think that people are starting to realize, now that we've kind of accepted that a large portion of our population is trash. (laughs) That they're not doing enough to balance all that trash. And that they're aiding and abetting in the trash. And now it's about finding it in their day-to-day life. And I think I'm so happy to have built something that is helping people find where they're aiding and abetting white supremacy and at least start down certain paths of, you know, trying to rectify that. Um, I do think the book would have done well. I was a writer who was doing well. But I don't think that... I think there's a large segment of liberal white America that really thought they had nothing to work on. People continuously talked about, before the book was coming out, they were saying, oh, I have all these relatives I'm gonna send it to. I'm gonna send it to my racist uncle. I'm gonna send it to, like, eh, you should read it first. (laughs) And I think that now that it's kind of become a part of this discussion in this movement, people are reading it first and kind of keeping it for themselves and realizing maybe their uncle's not ready for this yet, but they certainly need to be reading this and working on it. That's really, you know, in, 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 in an interesting sense because I think that people might have thought that uh, this book was at that time related to sort of the Black Lives Mo- 
um, Black Lives Matter movement, right? Yeah. And that, that's what it was addressing because people didn't understand what the issue was with cops and you, you know, you, you, you talk about police, or, you know, um, police enforcement. Actually, you have a strange way of expressing policing. Mm -hmm. I always loved it, you repeat it, and it really interested me. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna look in the book because <laughs> that's embarrassing, but if I was on a desk by myself, I would have looked and said, <laughs> this is the way you say it, but it won't pop in my mind. But you talk about, you know, the way, the fact that it was the, the, the policing and the history of policing, the way it's tied to racist institutions, and you, you delve into that, and so there was this idea that, you know, this book might just be related to that specific time, it might not have any relevance um, consequentially. Like, and that's the whole thing. Like, you know, yeah, um, actually you're talking about the deeper structures of racism and precisely there is no chance or there's no way that a Trump could resurface or become powerful in a context except for the one that you've sort of established and wrote in your book. I want, I want to say something in that respect really quickly. The, there are a number of books in the, in the top, we were talking about this in the back, the number of the books um, also in the uh, top sellers, uh, the best sellers list, were also in, you know, considering like, the, the situation in the United States as it is today. So it seems like a lot of people want to have answers as to like, how the hell did we get here? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and, and so to me, your, your, your book, in a sense, because it has such a, um, a huge investment in the historical side of these questions. I mean, you go from yourself and your situation with your family, and then you go right into the past. You dip, always dip into the history, right? And say like, no, these are, these are structural issues in a mm -hmm. sense. But the, um, I wanted to, to, to stop there. That was my thing. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I now wanted to ask you, I wanted to delve into the book, um, in a sense. Um, I wanted to, because there's always something, there's all these things in it that, 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 that make me pause. And um, I'm going to bring them up to you okay. one by one. All right. Right? <laughs> um, the first one is Africa Lounge. <laughs> yes. It still exists. I thought maybe I had the power to end Africa Lounge, and I don't. And I still walk by it every time I fly, and I'm like, yes. why? Okay, everybody, Africa Lounge is at the Seattle SeaTac. And the reason why I bring it up is because it's in the chapter where, where Joma talks about cultural appropriation. And she opens it um, in a discussion, but it's a very wonderful thing, because I've walked into this bar several times as an African. <laughs> <laughs> And all my mind was like, I need a glass of wine before I get on the bloody plane. <laughs> and I didn't even know like I was walking into an African themed, right? Yeah. And I get the wine and, I'm, and I walk out. And so when I read it, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? <laughs> what did I walk into? And I, I just love the way that you pick certain things, right? <laughs> And you're like, this is crazy. <laughs> and we is. accept it, and nobody's done anything about it. Like, why do we have an African restaurant in SeaTac that sells that no just serves food? nachos? <laughs> like, I don't, you know, and it's not even fully, like, I mean, have you looked at the art on the walls? There are like cave drawings. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Someone was like, nachos but make them Africa like what does that even mean and yeah and especially like this is an international airport right what an opportunity to showcase what international means and instead they're like oh it means it means burgers and fries is what it means and and you know exploitation it means you're gonna you know get these weird you're gonna sit on a zebra print stool uh with your beer and it just amazes me, you know, like how often people walk by it and they're just like, if it weren't for the fact that I was so excited yes. about the possibility of, get, of encountering African food after eating airport food for so long and then discovered that no, I was encountering, you know, beer and nachos, um, I may not have written it, you know, it may not have struck me the same, but you know, I was just like, oh, and I was like, oh no. This is the opposite of what I needed right now, and what I was expecting. And it just sits there and, and it, 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 no one, I, I keep walking past being like, why is nobody else even surprised? Like why is, no, why is everyone walking past this 
full costumery and just being like, hmm, cool. You know, like, I don't understand it. Um, but that being said, I'm actually doing an event next week um, in Wisconsin for the Wisconsin Library Association. And they, they asked me specially to come in because they booked this association at a fake safari <laughs> years ago and then realized it was a problem and they, they can't get their deposit back. <laughs> like, I'm not even joking. <laughs> and so they were like, can you come and to this fake safari and yell? And I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> And they're like, we'll book you a room. I'm like, oh, I'm not staying there. <laughs> I'm not going to sleep in this fake safari. It's, like called, Kal it's called Kalahari, and it's Kala a themed Ari. safari resort in Wisconsin. <laughs> you know, in case you're missing the safari, um, you can find it in Wisconsin. And yeah, I'm just like, how, how did whole committees, like, oh, yeah, this sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Um, like, and you know, make this decision, and then you get to close to the event, and someone's like, uh -huh, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> you know, and you know it was like the one black person that's like, do I have to say it? Oh God, do I have to be the one to say I don't want to go to a safari? And yeah, so it's a pretty common thing that people don't recognize. I call it the Toto effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 that, that particular song ruined us. <laughs> the rains of Africa. It's like, oh. The, the hamburgers of Africa. The, the, the Italian salad, the pasta of Africa. Yeah, it's all there. You know, but I, you know, I, 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 I want to then switch right back to the beginning of the book because I jumped ahead because I love jumping ahead. That's how my... My, my, my thinking happens sometimes. But um, I wanted to go, like, like, okay, everybody who writes a book always has like, someone they're writing to. I always yeah. believe a writer always sort of like, says, this person is you know, an imaginary mm -hmm. person. And I wanted to know who is the imaginary person in this, for this book? That oh, you man. So that's a, that's a bit of a tricky question, I would say, because for this book, I knew who I, I had different people I was writing to, and I had people I was writing for. So the person, every step of the way that I imagined needed to benefit and approve of everything I wrote was a black woman. But sometimes I'm writing to white people. Sometimes I'm writing to black people. Sometimes I'm writing to Latinx people, to native people, to Asian Americans. Um, but the four, like I, when I went through my final read, I was like, is this either speaking to the imaginary black woman in my head reading this? Is it making her day a little easier? Is it lifting some burden from her? Um, that was kind of my check. Um, you know, for something like race, when we're talking about systemic racism, there's so many parties involved, and there were times where, in order to make sure that that black woman wasn't increasingly burdened, I had to be really deliberate and say, this is, I'm talking to white people here you have to do this particular thing. I'm talking to people of color here. You, you need to know this particular thing um, because there's so many different ways in which anti-racist movements are oftentimes run on the backs of people of color and in particularly black women. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing anything to contribute to that. So that's really what I kept in mind. I always tell writers, write to know your audience and write to that audience and know further. But this one, because Everyone has a race. I had to know at least who I needed to benefit completely from it. Right. Now, um, you also have then, in the consequence, when you're developing this story and you're developing a sort of like, um, I always call it the point of departure, the point at which something sort of like launches, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, it was really your interactions with employees in this book. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, I wanted to get into this notion, and I wanted you to, to sort of like elaborate it, because I, you know what I mean? Like, that thing is really, is really complicated. Like, black people have to enter a workspace. Often it's dominated by white people. And then they have to have these interactions, and they have to also be 
um, sensitive or at least alert to the idea that they could get fired or yeah. they, their lives could be miserable. And I always thought this was, a, that, that from my point, I always thought that's sort of this launching pad that we have to make these, that we have to shut up or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get into this because it's a, a lot of times nobody, it's hard to explain this to anybody who is not black yeah. from my point. Like, you know, that, yeah, that's what we, we go through normally. Yeah, I think like for me, and I, everywhere I go, it's been interesting, I've been touring you know, on this book, and I'm going to people's workplaces, whether I'm speaking at universities, or people work there. And I can see the apprehension and fear and pain on staff members of color, and I will say in particularly black women, especially in academia. I think black women are carrying um, a really cruel amount of burden. Um, for their students of color and for other academia of color. Um, and I can see them quietly nodding, listening, and knowing they're not going to say a word when they have their next meeting while white people are like, oh, we're going to have so many great talks. This is going to be so fun. And you can just see the women of color in particular being like, oh God, I don't want to do this. Like I'm going to say something that's going to have, someone's going to get mad, I'm going to get fired, or I'm going to have, find myself isolated. It's, not, it's never going to be worth it. And you know, I remember living that life day in and day out of questioning, okay, is it really victory if I get fired and can't feed my kids, right? Um, where is it okay you carry this guilt of the things that you let slide, you know? And you don't live as a whole person. And part of why I knew I needed to start writing and talking more about race was I saw myself at 60 and 70 still just swallowing down all these things, still trying to find a way to, to work my hardest for a company that would be afraid the moment I got too loud or excited, that was never gonna pay me what I was worth, that was gonna see me as expendable, was never gonna see me as management material, you know, all of these things. And I would, I would still have to bend over backwards to get to that point. And I couldn't live like that. And now, I, I get paid to do the opposite, you know? And yes, there are, there's, a, there's a steep price I've paid these last couple of years for speaking so openly. But oh my God, I walk into every room as a whole black woman. I know that nobody, I don't have to swallow a single thing anyone says to me. It's my job. I'm not going to get fired by calling out the racism I see. I'm not going to, I'm not, no one's going to tell me I'm too loud. No one's going to tell me I'm too angry. I mean, people tell me I'm too angry, but they're not my target audience. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And whenever I find myself in situations and I'm looking out and I see people of color, even in the spaces I try to create where we talk about this, swallowing down their experiences because they know it's still not worth it, it guts me, you know? Um, people say that, like people like to say that I'm brave for what I do, but the truth is, is like I'm so privileged and there are so many people holding it down for their kids, for their families, swallowing immense amounts of abuse um, and fighting when they can and trying to figure out where that fight lives and, and you know, what part of the battle is their own, what part has to wait till later, because it's still gonna come back, right? You can decide you're gonna fight this comment today. Someone's gonna make that comment again tomorrow. Um, and it's just the strength that takes. And I wanted, in the book, the reason why I write about it so much is A, it was so crucial to why I came to writing. But also because I feel like so often in narratives around race and racism, you are only allowed to talk about what's happening if someone dies, you know, if, if someone is beaten. Um, the day-to-day -day struggles are never felt to be worthy of being put on the page. And I, 
I would read so many books and just not feel seen and heard. And I wanted other people to feel seen and heard. I wanted them to find little bits in these day-to-day -day interactions and know that at least it's worth being put down on paper. It's worth being memorialized. It's worth discussion, even if they don't feel safe having it. Yeah. Um, so there's, um, there's a lot to be um, digested in, <laughs> in what you've just said. And, um, but, you know, I wanted to do, I was really, there was one element that you brought up, and it's one of those things where you're like looking for like that kind of thing that you know could only happen in a situation, right, of that kind, of just ordinary, right, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Taking it and living with it, and it's not, it's, it's funny, but it's not, it's really sad in its, in, its, in, its, in its ultimate consequences. And it was just simply like, when you were talking about um, Good Hair and Chris Rock, and how the employees, the white employees, would say, I understand black hair, the, 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 you, know, you know what I mean? I understand the issue because I watched Chris Rock's good hair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you don't know when to, where to begin. <laughs> yeah. How do you have a conversation along those lines? And yet you, if you keep quiet, you'll be like, uh, you didn't, you know what I mean? you're being weird, and yeah. if you say something, it may sound too angry. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where, yeah, okay, I did watch Good Hair by um, Chris Rock, and I, it doesn't, you know, that, that, that says nothing, and you say that, that has nothing to do with yeah. what the situation is, and that, that, that aspect of the battle, anyway, to me was, was like, oh, that's it. That's like, nobody would under, would get, yeah. Yeah, it's the weirdest, like, I'm not going to try to actually get to know you as a person. Yeah. I watched this film. <laughs> and so now I know. <laughs> and we should be able to talk about your hair. Um, and it was the amount of times people asked me if I had seen that documentary. Like, I... What, I, I know what my hair is. I know, I don't need to know the history of, like, it's my hair. Right, right. And people like, have you seen? Have you seen good hair? <laughs> like, wh why? And they're like, oh my gosh, you just, it's so amazing. What black women will do to their hair? I'm like, really? <laughs> what? And it was so frustrating because I know what, white people do to their hair all the time. It's everywhere, right? Like every fashion magazine has a thousand ways to style white hair. Every commercial, right? Every friend star that got a haircut, it was the haircut everyone got. I know so much about what white people do to their hair. And the thought that you could watch one documentary and then know all about my hair and come tell me about my hair and tell me I need to watch this is just it's so absurd and there's so many ways in which people like white people are like this is my olive branch to you you should be glad right, right? you should be grateful I'm engaging in a different culture as if yes. white culture isn't shoved down my throat 24 hours a day you know like oh well you know okay I'm gonna go celebrate another St. Patrick's Day I guess like <laughs> it's and, and then someone's like, oh, I watched the documentary, and they stare at you expectantly, and you're just like, and? You know, like, and it happens, it's the, it's the weirdest, like, it's so fake, it's, it's so dehumanizing and small, and people don't get why it bothers. People are like, oh, but they're just trying to be nice, trying to have conversation. I posted um, after Black Panther came out, my family and I were eating, having a fun meal, and like we have fun. And there was this white couple sitting like at a table across, and they were not having fun. They were just eating like sad wasps. And <laughs> this woman kept looking at us as we're laughing, talking about our day, like longingly. And I was like, what is wrong with this woman? Like she just kept being like, Finally, like she just couldn't take it. 
And she turns to us and she goes, have y'all seen Black Panther? <laughs> I really loved it. And we're like, uh, yeah. And we just stared at her. And then she just turned back to her food. And I posted about it and people are like, you're really mean. That woman was trying to make friends with you. And, and what frustrated me, right, is that this woman I am not the only person of color this woman's ever encountered. There are people of color in her life, in her work, in her space. And she, instead of meaningfully engaging with them, finding out what's happening in their community, trying to have conversations, she's like, what if I interrupt this family's day and we'll become best friends because I watched a movie that they probably watched because they're black. And and it was just so insulting to me, and I'm just, you know, and people were so mad that I even commented on it. Like, this anonymous lady, right? They're like, she's gonna feel so bad. I'm like, no, she doesn't follow me on Twitter. <laughs> if she did, she wouldn't have dared. Like, But you know, it's these little things that happen all the time. Every person of color I know has someone who'll come up and give this weird non sequitur that'll be, you know, like even before the Obama years, I worked in this company and I worked remote, so I had never seen my boss. And I talk like this, right? And we had been talking on and off for years, you know, weekly calls, and then one day I mentioned something about being black. And she was like, you're black? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. She's like, you sound like you're from California. It's like, well, I don't know how to break this to you. Black people exist there. And she pauses and she goes, I hate George W. Bush, by the way. And that was it. And like, this was before Obama. And I was just like, all right, well, let's get back to this meeting, you know, and it's just so, uh, I don't know, it's so weird how we can exist and know a whole library of stuff. Like, I'm sure you know so much about white people. I know so much, so more than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> and they know so little about us. They know like a film, they know a hair documentary, right. they listen to an album, you know, um, they like some music, and then they think we're going to be best friends. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I, I saw some Italian guys, and they said, you know, I watched The Godfather. <laughs> 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 I'm down with you guys. <laughs> I get what's going on at this table. <laughs> That's why you have your back against the wall. You're just waiting for, you know, you never know when someone's gonna come murder you. It's, as all Italians do. But we have to live through this all the time. And what, what still sort of amazes me is that um, even, you know, there, okay, there's this thing. It's this little thing. And it's a, it's a point that I come to again and again when I think of your work. And it, um, it comes out of a very, very small comment that you make to somebody who's like looking at poverty. And they say that uh, you do two things. You say, the person is dealing with poverty, and you say, um, they say like, oh, we should just, they should do drug tests uh, because uh, to, get, to, get, to, get, to get welfare in the sense that I do drug tests to get, to get like, you know what I mean, to get, a, to get into a job, and then they say like, and someone says, oh, we should sterilize all the poor because they're basically trying to, you know, get money from babies, which is like, and you say something which is totally stunning to me, and, and it's something that haunts me to, to this day because I really did believe that stuff like that was dead, right? Mm -hmm. And that the idea that, we, that people will actually say that and believe that, and I was like, okay, Okay, you tell me, when did that, when did that comment happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, no, it was right, um, let's see, I mean, it was probably about eight years ago. Right. And, but it's still, yeah. I have uh, family members who post this, stuff like this on their Facebook pages. It's, you know, if I have to get a drug test for work, you should get a drug test for welfare. Right. Um, 
you know, all of these things, pull up your pants, get a job. Like, and sometimes I feel like I'm in this weird farce, right? Where I'm like, oh, this is real life? Like, people are actually this, this vile and have these simplistic views of the world and think so little of, in like, in what has been, oh, capitalism is cruel, right? right? I don't know what more evidence we need that it's cruel and punishing and grinding and that there are certain people who will never ever be able to get out from under those gears and we still have huge segments of the population that are like people are buying steaks with their welfare checks you know right. um it just appalls me the commitment to ignorance and hatred that people have um, because it takes work it takes work to look at all the evidence we have that says otherwise and still come out with those beliefs. Yeah, and still also to, in the worst way, um, to force us to continually battle against such stupidities <laughs> without end. I'm sorry, that's a comment that, I mean, there, there was a thing, Ijama also points out in her book often, and it's a thing that people don't get, is that, a lot of us, a lot of people don't want to write about this stuff all the time, and one would love to deal with other themes and other subjects. But if you're so far back that people today actually believe that, you know, in, in, in a classic situation where you say like sterilization means something specifically to black people because that was a program. Forced sterilization, yeah, for black and native people. And, and Latinx women as well. Um, yeah, like that was, an, that's, that was an actual program to stop us from procreating <laughs> and to thin us out of the population. Like that, that happened to us and you can't divorce these conversations, right. especially when you look at that same sort of oppression is why so many people of color live in poverty. And then say, we're gonna talk about bringing back these horrifically cruel, um, you know, unethical practices it's always going to have, no matter what your intent, it's going to have a racial tinge. You know, it's funny you talk about how I don't like having these conversations. I actually, you haven't, you haven't read the paperback yet, but I actually mention you in the paperback. Oh. Um, <laughs> oh by the way, I didn't get the paperback. Yeah. Um, what, what do you say about me in the paperback? It's just brief. <laughs> um, yeah, I would forgotten until now when you mentioned that, because so Charles and I used to work together a lot. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of my Rachel Dolezal interview. Um, that was Charles's brainchild, uh, and I wouldn't have done it if it weren't for his very insistent prodding and just the overall glee in his voice when he called me. <laughs> we can really do this, Joma. We can really do this. And I'm like, um, I knew what he was gonna ask me before he asked me too, because I had just gotten all these texts about Rachel Dolezal, and then, I get this phone call, missed call from him, and I'm like, oh, that bastard. <laughs> but the thing I loved most about like, working with Charles, um, and I miss writing with you all the time, I complain about it constantly, it really has broken my heart to not be able to, is he would call me, you would call me and say, can you write about this? And I would be like, meh. I'm so tired of this, I hate this, I never want to write about this again. The world is awful and why, why do I have to spend, why do I have to waste my time talking about what white people are doing and I don't want to? And then you would be like, well then write that. <laughs> and, and some of, I think, the pieces that I'm most proud of came out of that. Um, and that was a behavior too that I tried to practice and mimic in other spaces, you know, um, and like we were gonna do a film review for Suffragette and I went to go see it. You yeah. remember Suffragette? Yeah, yeah. And I even met with the director and I watched this film and I was like, ugh, <laughs> oh my God. Like not only were there no people of color in this movie, right, like as if women of color didn't exist in the suffrage movement, they invented a whole new white woman. Like they had the power to invent a whole yeah. new white woman, but they couldn't actually document the actual women of color that were there fighting for this. And I just couldn't do it. And it was supposed to be for print too, I remember, and I just kept dragging my feet. 
and I'm not usually late like that. And, and then Charles was like, okay, are you gonna write this? And I was like, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, I just, I can't do it. Like I can't legitimize another film that erases women of color. And even, even writing about it to say I didn't like it, writing this interview means that it's something worth, that worth debating in, what was it, 2016, I think. And you were like, okay, write that. <laughs> and so I did, and I wrote a piece called Why I'm Not Going to Review Suffragette. <laughs> and it was interesting because I heard from so many actors, like on major television shows, there was an actor from like this vampire show that was like, look, I finally got some major screen time, and they made my character mute and I'm the only black vampire. <laughs> and like, you know, just hearing from all these people who had been in the business, and like, we did, you know, um, that's the one thing I really loved was that frustration I could just, I knew there was no one else, there was no other editor I could talk to that would get it if I explained why I didn't want to do these pieces, um, why things frustrated me and made me angry, and I think that even if you didn't always immediately get it, you trusted my voice enough, um, and you had enough of your own frustrations, I'm sure, in the industry to just be like, well, it sounds like you're pretty passionate about that. You have a lot of words. <laughs> Go. Um, and that was beautiful because it helped me break that cycle of I, that I had to engage in these things that honestly it was an insult to engage in. There are some times where I'm like, I can't believe I'm writing this again. I can't believe I have to say this again. And sometimes where I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I don't. And I think part of that was like working with you, I loved that, anyways. That was, I, so I, that's what I talk about just briefly, much more briefly than I just <laughs> said in the book because I think it actually helped shape me as a writer in many ways and I'm really grateful for that. That's my little sappy moment, but it's true. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was, actually that piece was one of, one of the biggest pieces um, on the website. It, it, anyway, I'm very happy and proud of it. <laughs> and I, wanted, I always wanted to thank you for that. But there's, um, I wanted to get, I wanted to sort of start sort of, sort of wrapping around the, the book because there's something you told me in the back. I'm sorry, like we're talking about, and you think like, oh, I want to talk about everything that I've been thinking about for the past week, like, and I talk about everything that we just said <laughs> like, <laughs> 10 minutes ago back there. And I said, Ijama, aren't you going to read a bit of your book? And you said you wouldn't. Yeah. And I wanted you to, I'm sorry, I was like, I was kind of like, you know, yeah. why you wouldn't do that? Yeah. Um. Are you upset me about me asking that question? Yeah, no, no, I'm not. I'm not upset about it, because um, I, I think it's an important part of the discussion of how a lot of these books work. Yeah. Um, I had to include personal narrative in every chapter. And I did it focusing on people of color, hoping they would see themselves in it. But the truth is, unfortunately, it's also the hook, right? Um, 400 years into the system of white supremacy, we still have to tug at heartstrings in order to get white people to, to accept that maybe these are issues they have to care about, which means that for every chapter of the book, I had to pull myself apart and find lived experiences that showcase the trauma of these issues. And every time I read, a chapter, I start crying. And I don't want to do that, um, especially not for white people. And I don't know if you notice, there's a lot of you out here. <laughs> and, you know, the book exists. I did the work, I put the pain out there, and to come out and perform it, to make it part of the experience, I just don't want to, and I shouldn't have to. And so I just don't. So, you know, um, you'll have to read it yourself <laughs> and feel bad on your own time. <laughs> right? 
Okay, before I go into there's something, there's a passage I have to read out. <laughs> My own thing. If you want to read your own book, I'll read it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it out because I had to, like, I couldn't stop laughing and I've always laughed um, at certain things. And this is in chapter five. Okay. Right? It's a chapter on intersectionality. Uh-huh. And then, and then, I mean, we can go into that a little bit afterwards, but I wanted just to read this because there's a mystery here. <laughs> and I wanted you to resolve it on the stage yeah. tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. Okay. Um, there was Twitter, which you're involved, and in. you mentioned this a lot, you know. Yes. And, uh, but it started quietly enough weeks earlier. I found out that a famous black male musician was coming to town to perform. This musician, who we shall remain, who shall remain nameless, was long believed by many, including myself, to be a sexual predator of uh, multiple young black women and teenage girls. Uh, how could a notorious, uh, how could a man so notorious for s- suspicion of such uh, um, heinous offenses sell out a, an arena in liberal Seattle? Um, who's this nameless person? Oh. <laughs> yeah, the uh, nameless person is R. Kelly. <laughs> that um, was a yeah. joke, by the way. Yes. <laughs> I knew it was R. Kelly. <laughs> if anybody thought I did not know... You you don't. You it was don't amazing know me. to me, you know. Yeah, because I mean, this all happened. I think 2015 was when this happened, and or yeah, I think it was 15. And people, when the book came out, were like, "Yes, is it R. Kelly?" <laughs> and then, of course, Dreams' amazing um, Docu- documentary right. came out. And people were like, oh, it's R. Kelly. <laughs> like, in the know, whereas black women, you know, like, we've been talking about for right. so long, for over a decade, trying to, trying to get people to understand this. But yeah, it was, it was so funny, because legally, of course, before this was all very, very public, you just couldn't put a name in there. And it was so frustrating. So I was trying to make it as obvious as possible. <laughs> um, in a world full of really trash dudes that I was talking about this particular trash dude. Um, but yeah, it's been funny to watch now since the documentary came out, people have been like... That's not... <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of those things. But speaking of which, um, I know that you had a really big sort of like, um, um, a lot of people on Twitter were upset about it and they started like sort of writing you and filling your boxes. You're, you know, and, and, and saying stuff, and you're, you're saying that, oh, my, my, my thing was dinging and all yeah. this stuff. And come. But I wanted to talk about that in relationship to what's happening to you recently. I want to make a transition to that. You know, because, of course, uh, you have a big presence on the Internet, and, and that was the first situation where, you, you know what I mean, where you're, you're sort of facing this, this, this reality of being visible on, on, on Twitter and other social media platforms, and now you're at another level of, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a lot. Um, I'll say, first of all, what's been happening to my family these last few months is something that I think any black woman who's semi-prominent on Twitter could have predicted and had. Um, it's kind of been my worst nightmare come true, uh, if you aren't familiar. Um, my, my home address was doxxed, which happens. Um, it means my address was put online, my contact information. But it was put online on a specific white supremacist site with aims towards swatting. Swatting is where you spoof a phone number that's near the house of the target, call the police, and say you murdered someone or you're holding someone hostage. The intent is to get an armed SWAT response in the house. And as a black woman, this has been one of my biggest fears in this work. I saw this, this first started in the gaming community and a lot of people thought it was just pranks amongst gamers, but oftentimes targeted were women in a gaming community, a way to keep women out of the gaming community or men who spoke up in defense of women during Gamergate. Um, I immediately saw 
because the Venn diagram of these dudes in like white supremacist is a big circle. Um, <laughs> that it was just a matter of time before we'd be targeted. I got an alert that I was on this website and I saw they had, um, they had lists of dozens of people and they had these symbols, you know, money if they had your financial information, checks if they'd verified your address, and then they had a little gun if they had successfully swatted the, your house. Um, I called the police, let them know I was at risk, and they flagged my address. And they were like, hopefully you won't have to use it. A few weeks later, I was in Boston um, flying home, and it was 6 a.m. Seattle time, and I kept getting, I was getting a bunch of frantic calls from a number I didn't recognize, and they answered, and it was the sheriff's office. Um, and they said, we have a report of shots fired at your house. And immediately, you're half panicked and half angry. Like, part of you thinks that chances are there's no shots fired. But what if? And... I said, I think this is a swatting. We don't have a gun in the house. And they said, well, that's why we're calling. You know, we saw the flag. They said, but we still have to send a response. And so then I knew I'm on the other side of the country and my 17-year-old son is asleep because it's six in the morning and cops are coming to the house. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with teenagers. <laughs> they don't wake up. <laughs> And they're not known for making rational decisions. And when boys of color in particular act like boys of color in stressful situations, they often end up dead. So I was in a complete panic and I couldn't get my son up. Luckily I had a neighbor who was awake and I had him go pound on my son's window and get him to answer the phone. I said, honey, cops are coming. They're trying to call you right now. I need you to answer. I need you to talk to the dispatcher. No one's hurt but you know, they're gonna be coming. Um, six officers with rifles showed up at the house. My son wasn't dressed, he was in his pajamas, he didn't have shoes and socks on. There was some sort of miscommunication, they were yelling at him to put the phone down, he was pulled out of the house, he was scared after death. Um, they were asking him, did you call, did you do this, and he had no idea what anyone was talking about. They went through the house, you know, found out that no, there were no, um, dead bodies in the house. What we found out was someone had called actually pretending to be my son, um, saying that, they, that he had killed his parents. So my son was deliberately targeted. And I'm on a plane and trying to figure out, you know, I can't get home and bawling in the middle of this plane, trying to get someone to text me <laughs> because I don't have phone reception anymore to make sure everyone's safe. And luckily, he was. Um, but since then, it's been harassment. You know, especially once it hit the news, it was pretty much verified that, yes, this is where we live. It's still there. My address is still there. My social security number's there. Um, you know, we get deliveries. One day, we had 12 food deliveries in an hour. Um, requesting payment, you know, because they'll just call up wherever will come. Anyways, it's been a lot, but it's also something that I think anyone in this space could have predicted, because online harassment is real life harassment, and the borders between that are very thin. And the space that people of color take up, and especially black women take up on social media, is a direct threat to white supremacy, and so now it's being targeted. I'm one of dozens of journalists, black journalists especially, who've been targeted by the Singh group. And Leonard Pitts, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist that was swatted a few months ago, was targeted by the Singh group. Um, and then, you know, you're trying to get the FBI to look at it, but the FBI, of course, still can't, won't take black identity extremists off their list of top concerns. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that what we have here isn't kids who don't know the impact of what they're doing. These aren't angry, bored, white teenagers. These are angry young men who have found a sense of identity and power 
in white terrorism. And that has been allowed by the complicity, complacency of everyday white Americans who continuously justify this white male anger at us that has never had any real justification that continuously say, oh, well, let's find out why all these articles, get to know the Nazi next door, you know, mm -hmm. are legitimizing this murderous hatred and providing identity where white men didn't feel they had one. Their identity right now, these, these people, is their ability to wage terror. And that is because we continuously look at these gateways as not a real threat. We continuously look at this dialogue, you know, treating, even treating the Trump election like it was about the economy and not about white identity is a gateway into this. It's a place where people can hide and legitimize and give them a sense of power where they didn't have one. And I need people to understand that they're aiding and abetting an extremely violent radicalization of white identity that is going to kill people that is killing people. And it needs, you know, the community members, the family members of these men need to recognize the role they're playing in legitimizing this and giving a safe space for it. You know, just in Seattle, we were, there was a debate about one of those neighborhood next door groups when one of the members was found to be a member of Proud Boys and attending these white supremacist rallies. And the leader of the group said, well, it doesn't mean he's done anything wrong. <laughs> We're not gonna kick someone out just because they're part of a white supremacist group. Yeah. That is where this is given room to breathe and grow. And the impact ends up being something like me spending six hours in the plane wondering if my son's gonna make it out okay, you know? Um, it has a real life impact. And it's not small. I don't know any black people who feel safe. I don't know any people of color who feel safe in America. And whether it's they fear something like this or just someone feeling like flexing their power out in the street. All of that naked hatred has been emboldened by a complacent white America. Um, and we need to start looking at it as a national emergency. We need to start looking at it as a real cancer and start actively rooting it out and preventing these safe spaces for it to grow. All right. Thank you. Um, I just wanted um, the white supremacist to know that the title of her next book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next book, because I like to make my life simpler, um, is it's called Mediocre, A Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Um, <laughs> What's really funny too is, So You Want to Talk About Race got exclusively good reviews, positive reviews. And it's not, I think, because it's the best book ever written. It's because, and I'm not trying to say racists don't read, because that's not true. Are you sure? But they don't want to. <laughs> I, they you, don't, do a, you do a lot of historical research. <laughs> they do, they do read, it's been proven. But they don't read books they will hate. Whole books, right? They'll read an article, they'll read a tweet. I've gotten more hatred from tweets. Um, so what's interesting is even like that website that posted my address, they had to post quotes because they knew none of these dudes had read a single thing I'd written. Oh, right. But if they wanted right. them to hate me enough to attack me, they were gonna have to then provide some words because none of them, they were like, who, what? That's a lot of, you know, they're not gonna invest that time. The next book, I don't even think they'll have to do that. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Sorry. That's 
always a danger with that. <laughs> but um, I want to, um, what, um, I wanted to now, I think, I think we were done. I got a feeling nobody. I don't know, I don't know where everyone is. Everyone. But I thought we should, I wanted just to ask, just, uh, I wanted to go down before we switch to, um, to a conversation with everybody. Um, I wanted to just to go down to a list of things that, um, that are happening at this moment. <laughs> this is my last thing. I said, to, because in a way the book was written two years ago and I was like, I know that, but there, you know, we're still in this culture and things mm -hmm. are happening all the time and there are these developments, but um, 10 years, what mm -hmm. do you think about that? Hmm? 10 years. You're gonna have to give me more context. <laughs> Well, there's this woman who shot this black man who was... In oh, the God, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so... That was so, my joke, sorry. So I she was got like, 10 years at the 10 end years. Of the um, this has been, like, watching this, I mean, has been gutting, right? right? In so many ways. One thing that has really, really pissed me off is when they allowed the Castle Doctrine... Thank God there was still a guilty verdict because that doctrine has consistently come out against black victims. Um, the castle doctrine is basically stating that, you know, in defense of your castle, you can shoot someone. And they decided that they would allow this, the judge decided, a black judge, would allow this to be considered even though this white woman wasn't even in her own home. Like she had entered the wrong home and killed a black man who was eating a bowl of ice cream. And I keep envisioning it over and over and over and over and over and over, sitting there in your home, and a white woman bursts in and shoots you in the chest. Um, and I posted about this, about how this is how systemic white supremacy works, right? Systemic racism works is that you will create an environment of fear of black people that will cause violence, and then you will have a system that will justify that fear. And then, Luckily, it was guilty. And then people immediately started saying, well, it's guilty because she's a woman. There's no, you know, and in trying to talk about how she was a, you know, a sacrificial lamb. Um, never in the history of America has a white woman been sacrificed for a black man. Yeah. <laughs> It's just absurd. The actual right. premise is absurd. Right. Like, like the system decided to throw us one. What? No. I mean, whatever patriarchy thinks of white women, and it doesn't think much, it thinks nothing of black men. Less than nothing. It doesn't give a token conviction to white women who murder black men. Black men have been killed on the word of white women. Black, white women have been active participants in the murder and degradation, in particularly of black and native people, for hundreds of years. And to watch this discussion amongst white feminists immediately pivot. One, one white woman reached out to me on Twitter and said, that's intersectionality, right? And now it's 10 years, 10 years, a 26-year-old man was gunned down by a racist white woman who was too busy sexting on her phone to notice she was in the wrong home and saw a black man sitting in front of a bowl of ice cream and thought, I'm going to kill him. 10 years. He was worth 10 of her. And she gets 10 years in his family has to miss him forever, and it's just gutting. Um, and yet, if you had asked me two days ago if I thought she'd get any years, I would have said no. Mm. And I'm angry that I have to be grateful that it's 10 years and not zero. Like, it's just so dehumanizing, you know? It's so... It, pulls a bit of you apart when you find yourself making these bargains of where to find relief. And, you know, I was prepared to be utterly crushed and have it be not guilty. 
And now I have to feel something about 10 years, and it's still nothing. Yeah. You know? The lawyer, the, pros the prosecutor started listing off black people killed by police and saying, this is for them, this is for them, this is for them. 10 years for Trayvon, you know, 10 years for Sandra Bland. God, how fucking sad, right? That like, we have to take this for all of them. It's just, it's a heartbreaking reality. And like, yeah, this case has had me feeling a lot of ways. <laughs> No. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, <clears throat> um, I'm always angry uh, for having been happy. No, I'm angry about wanting somebody, wanting to convict somebody for 28 years. Yeah. This is the thing that I was like bothers me. It's like I don't, I don't believe in a system. I don't believe in the system, yeah. the justice system as it exists. Yeah. And I don't believe, you know what I mean, the way it works. And so when the situation of somebody who's clearly committed a murder, you've and I want justice in the way that you've done justice to blacks yeah. and all of this. I get angry because I don't think that that was justice to yeah. begin with. Yeah. So I don't really, I hate being pushed in a situation where I'm like, give her 28 years, but that's like, that's all you give people. Yeah. Oh, right? and when you think, look, what's it going to take? Because we know we're not going to get the systemic reforms. Right. Right? We know that this murder isn't going to cause cops to re-up and anti-bias training. It's not gonna cause us to go all the way to the roots of anti-blackness in the police force. And you're like, well, what's gonna make him stop? Maybe 28 years will make someone pause. I'm like, what will it take to get yes. someone to pause? Right. And I don't care at this point if they pause because they see a human or not or if they pause because they see the possibility of 28 years. I just need them to pause and think, and they're not. And that's where we find ourselves, you know, even as abolitionists, <laughs> wishing for prison terms because yes. we're like, God, yeah. what will it take? What will, obviously hearts and minds aren't doing it. So maybe it's gotta cost something, and that's an awful place to find yourself in. And it's simply because we can't get the system to actually care enough to root out the, these issues, you know? And so then we start valuing life based on how many years are given to the person who takes it. Ah, well that's a bleak point, um, <laughs> but it's an important point. But it's something that uh, I, I think that, that um, that people, when, when you're reading that, thing, the way you're wrapped up in it, and the way you're like thinking of all the aspects of it, and you're thinking of the amount of people who spent so many t years in jails for such, less, for such lesser crimes, it's brutal, yeah. right? You're like, oh my gosh, really I live in this society. Yeah. I live in a society where that happens. Yeah, where black men caught with weed are serving equal sentences, you know? Right. The it's whole, ridiculous. Yeah, and that's it. So, okay. But um, um, I, the last thing, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to get into any more <laughs> contemporary news because um, it, there's a lot of different things, but I wanted just to, 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 to open it up to, to, to the audience to um, ask questions. Oh, yeah, there's, uh, there's to, microphones, the, the I guess. microphones there. And Up here. Let's have that happen. Um, by the way, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, um, Ijoma and I were actually very busy last year because um, I directed her in a film. Yes. Thin Skin, I want to say this. Yes. She's an actress. <laughs> and, and if you go to page uh, 30... Three or so, um, you'll see one of the scenes we took directly from her book <laughs> <laughs> and put on the screen. I didn't want to say that. Is that legal? Will the producer be upset I said that? But no, no. I, I won't sue you. No, no, no. <laughs> but it's definitely, she, it was a great working with her. And you, if you want to, you'll get a chance to see her act in the near future. Yeah, that was such an experience. I'm so excited and proud of that. And that was so fun. And, and working with Charles, the director, <laughs> was a riot. Let me tell you, one of these days, y'all, 
I'll, ex I'll, t I'll give you all of the stories of how amazing it was. But it was a lot of fun. There were a lot, there was a lot of wildlife involved. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed that. That was a lot of, that was a great experience. I'm so excited, I'm so proud. This is a movie that Charles, it, my brother, Ahame Faleolul, and Lindy West wrote. Um, and it's really an adaptation of my brother's story. Um, that of course, because I exist, I am in as well. <laughs> and it was just <laughs> lovely and wonderful. And I, I can't wait for people to be able to see it. Thank you. All right. I thought I'd just uh, offer the transition up to questions. Um, just keep it brief. Um, I'm going to flip up that mic, but look, we can start over here. Good evening. My name is Omari Salisbury. Um, from Seattle, born and raised, Central District of Seattle, James, James A. Garfield High School. Uh, you already know. So my question, especially, you know, like you said, on the hometown scene and everything else, from the Central District of Seattle, which, you know, the Central District, black people have been there for almost 140 years. You know, a lot of people don't know that. They think that it was World War II or whatever, but it's 140 years back when it was Washington Territory, mm -hmm. is as long as black people have lived in the Central District. Uh, um, William Gross bought 12 acres of land from Henry Esler, which is now the Central District. And I sit in a room here, and not to judge anybody, but you know, in very liberal Seattle with a bunch of very liberal white people, and I sit in a community and neighborhood that's being totally gentrified yeah. by liberal Seattle and liberal policymakers. And I'm wondering, what's the disconnect? Like, you've written a book, you know what I'm saying? How can people <laughs> understand that it's like, you know, our culture has value in the Central District, our history has value, and you know, other neighborhoods in Seattle, you know, people, people, you know, they, they look at their history and culture differently and they disregard our culture yeah. and it's okay for us to be wiped away. And I think maybe a book like yours might be able to help to bridge the gap for people to see that, you know what I'm saying, our culture matters as well. Yes, thank you for that. I can tell you that it is so heartbreaking to see, it's, there's something about seeing all these Black Lives Matter signs on the homes of gentrifiers. Um, because you're like, in where, how, in what way, what outside of the sign, you know, um, you're occupying and displacing. And it's a real, it's a real issue. And, and part of the problem is that when you have a extreme majority of whiteness like we have in Seattle, you can become really accustomed to calling yourself liberal without actually having to make any accommodations for people of color, right? <laughs> you get to build this whole identity and imagine yourself this crusader because you've never had to do anything. And that becomes the norm that if you say the right things, you share the right Facebook statuses, then woo, you're a warrior. And then the moment that someone asks you to consider your actual actions, it becomes an, an attack on your entire identity. White Seattle has gotten way too many free passes to call themselves liberal. When we look at the bills we pass, the way we fund our education, the way you know, in which we look at policing, the way in which we treat poor and homeless people, the way in which we treat addicted people, we are not a liberal city. And part of why I wrote was because I was realizing, I grew up here, that my community wasn't, this wasn't my community. They would never get in my back. You know, people would come out hard, harder for recycling than they would come out for black lives. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it's going to take because what, what will happen, what is happening, is that the community that brought the culture and the commentary and the freshness that white people so desperately want, especially because I hate to say it, y'all, but white Pacific Northwesters are boring. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. that they come, it becomes white people come here, then they expect 
that it will be theirs, that they can come and shove and surround it and raise the prices. They still want the same profits off their homes um, when they move into these neighborhoods for the culture. And then they call it progress when we have to move somewhere else. And what will happen then is it becomes everything starts looking like Kirkland. <laughs> and then we move to another space that we've been shoved into and await the new storm of white people trying to leave Kirkland for something better. And we just keep moving and we can't put down roots. And we are robbed of community, security, intergenerational wealth, opportunity. We're robbed of any presence in schools. We're robbed of designing our neighborhoods. And then, we're, and then people will say, it's progress. You can't afford to live here. You haven't been trying hard enough. And it's gross. Um, people, black people in Seattle, have had to move from space to space to space. The communities that would have given us opportunities to do what white people got to do, which is build community, amass intergenerational wealth, put down roots in political power, those foundations are consistently being torn out from under us. Um, and if you live in the central district, you're a part of the problem. I don't care how you voted. Um, and you need to find a way to reckon with that and find out what you owe and figure out what it looks like to try to make that right. And that's real. You can't send a Facebook status to change that. You know, you can't <laughs> come here and expect that to change. You owe, you've stolen. And I don't think we need to keep letting people off the hook for saying things that sound nice. It means nothing when you look at the wealth disparities in King County for black and Latinx and native households versus white households, some of the steepest in the country. When we look at the opportunity gap in schools, some of the worst in the country. We've been robbed and y'all owe. And you need to get together and figure out if you honestly think Black Lives Matter, how much? Hi. Hi, my name is Belen Herrera. Um, I am not from Seattle, I'm originally from California. So, and I just wanna say thank you so much for being here. I've been looking forward to you speaking for like weeks. And I was like, I don't care if I'm sick. I was definitely getting Aww. out here regardless. <laughs> so um, my question, or kind of give you some background context, is that I work for the city of Seattle. Um, and uh, I work in specifically transportation. And so my colleagues are actually here with me, which is really exciting. Um, but I also, in addition to my job, what's I think incredible, at least within my department and very city departments um, are in the area, is that they have this thing called a race and social justice initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's different change teams within the departments to hopefully move forward and break down institutional racism. Right, this is all language and policy yeah. that uh, without action doesn't move forward and so hopefully these individuals help contribute to you know, chipping away at it. Um, but what I've started noticing just personally as I'm navigating not just white spaces but also the institution um, as a re relatively recent grad um, is as I'm also educating myself and leading a few trainings, like how to talk about race, um, leading uh, trainings about this video called uh, Race of Pattern Illusion, that when I try to hopefully um, apply my own lived experiences to projects, making sure it's more equitable community engagement, um, understanding some cultural context to some of the projects, even though I'm not from here, understanding the community, Amongst my own colleagues, I hope, especially uh, my fellow uh, people of color, or especially uh, black women and black men in the workspace who I work with, um, 
I hope that I'm not reinforcing that white supremacy culture. And so my question to you is how can I also be just a better ally? I don't know if that's a good word, but that's the closest thing I can think of. Accomplice, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> um, um, and, yeah. You know, I mean, I think part of it first is just to start to pay really close attention to your environment and, and try to signal that you're willing to put yourself on the line and, and have conversations and listen and center the lived experiences of people at the crosshairs of systemic racism in your workplace. Um, part of it too is as you're leading these conversations, one of the biggest risks I find oftentimes is that we so prioritize the edification of whiteness that we do so at the expense of people of color. And we think that whatever pain is brought up, whatever discomfort is brought up, it's all worth it if at the end a white person gets it. And it's not. And I think one of the most important things you can do if you're trying to facilitate these conversations is to recognize that the safety and humanity of the people of color in the room is always going to be the most important thing. And that means oftentimes having conversations ahead of time with attendees of color as to what they would need for these conversations to be better, safer, what, they, what their boundaries are, what they're expecting of you, what they would like to hear from white attendees, and being willing to really enforce that and center that and know that, you know, being willing to often scrap the whole conversation if it looks like something that will first do harm. We really need to shift the way that we look at these things and recognize that first and foremost, it's the humanity of people of color that white supremacy seeks to deny. And so anytime we lose track of that, even in anti-racist efforts, we reinforce white supremacy. So rarely are people of color asked before these discussions, A, if they even want to participate, and B, what problems they've had in the past, what their fears are, what would make them comfortable, what they hope to get out of the discussion. And I think starting with that, centering that, and then setting up real accountability for white people who trespass those boundaries is probably one of the most important things you can do in order to help. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wrote it down so I won't fumble it. Um, so with the anti-racism consulting space being fairly young, but the issue of our white supremacist power structure being hundreds of years in process, with the same themes repeated over and over throughout time and written and spoken about thoroughly without compensation by black people, do you feel that it is or how do you feel about white people being making money in the equity consulting field by, <laughs> by, by coining terms like white fragility, not naming names, uh, <laughs> that the black community has been speaking about for ages? Should white folks profit off of equity work, or is this just another new space that white people will take the biggest, best, first, and most of? That is a great question. Um, I will say, <laughs> I feel so many different ways about this. One, I do think that white people absolutely have work they have to do to deconstruct white supremacy. For so long, the burden has been placed on people of color, um, as if we magically are going to increase in power and be able to deconstruct the system that's been placed upon us. White people have to do this space, but I would say first and foremost, they need to be doing it in white spaces. It needs to be informed by people of color and centering the needs of people of color. And I think that the way in which it is embraced and done needs to be cognizant of how it interacts with white supremacy. And I think that that's the piece that's often missing People can have really important contributions to whiteness studies. People have, white people have. 
But the problem is, is when they don't look at how they then engage with the field and whether or not their reception reinforces white supremacy or is boosted by white supremacy. There are people who do this work and don't come back to communities of color to see if they're still relevant, don't have systems to hold themselves accountable. Whether or not people should make money off of it, I don't think anyone should get rich. Any white person should get rich off of it. I understand that in a capitalist society, people have to feed their families. But I will say this. People of color are fighting racism every single day, and we don't get a check for it. If anything, it costs us our livelihood. And it takes us away from the work that feeds our families. And therefore, I think whiteness as a whole can really stand to do some of this work without the immediate expectation that they're going to be making money or getting even getting thanks from it. Um, I think that as an industry, I'm very troubled with seeing how quickly and how much money there is in anti-racism consultancy, where someone goes into an office for a day, talks, leaves, um, especially when it's white people. People of color, get that money. Because yeah. um, <laughs> it's not like they're gonna take it and, and give it to somewhat to a better cause. Um, it'll go to like, you know, upgrading the coffee machines. So take it. But I think that it is very easy for people to toss around buzzwords and build a really lucrative career. And I think it's especially easy for white people to do that in a way that people of color can't. Um, and, and that does trouble me. And it, it troubles me that we would have this quick fix industry in the first place. When I go and speak at places, I'm amazed at the magnitude of issues that institutions are hoping I'll solve in an hour. <laughs> and I'm like, every time I'm like, look, the most I can do is make people of color in this room feel heard. Maybe give them a little more backup for their next meeting. That's all that I can accomplish in an hour especially if you're not gonna A, give me any specific issues you're having in your organization. You, you don't have an Oregon place to follow up on this. You don't have an action plan. And to see white people offer this up as a lucrative, I know what the money looks like in this field. It's obscene. We're talking tens and tens of thousands of dollars for a single afternoon spent. Um, while employees of color are struggling to get by and swallowing loads of racism for substandard pay. I feel a lot of ways about it. I'm not trying to say I don't value the contributions that some white scholars have made, but I can say I can A, count those on one hand. Um, but I think whatever ethical struggle white scholars are doing with the amount of money they're making I really hope it's a struggle, <laughs> and I hope it's something that they work on and look at. I am more disturbed by the eagerness with which white audiences seek out this work than I am the people that are providing the work. I'm far more disturbed by how much white people still want to hear discussions on lives of people of color filtered through whiteness before they will hear it from actual people of color. That bothers me more than anything. Um, you know, and, I, and that's where I want people to see. I don't necessarily hold a lot against white people in the field. And I do think that some of the study and work done is valuable. But I hold a lot against the people who are disproportionately propping up a lot of this work and are daring, honestly, to recommend it in the same breath as the work of scholars of color who are living this reality day in and day out. Like, that bothers me a lot. I would rather whiteness studies be looked at as whiteness studies and these books being recommended in the field of whiteness studies, but to dare say, you should take up this book by ta Coates and then this other book by this white writer, what? Oh, God.
you know, that, that's an insult to me. Um, and, and that's something that I think that white audiences need to look at, how comfortable they're, they're expecting to be um, when they pick up a piece of work. And why they haven't been making bestsellers out of the black writers and writers of color who have been writing this stuff down for multiple generations. That's a question I want white audiences to really grapple with. So we uh, have passed the 9 p.m. mark. Um, I do want to allow time for a signing, so I'm, I'm going to make this the last question. OK. Hi. So uh, one thing I want to say here, I know you have a question coming up. I will, I will have you ask your question. I'll try and be quick about it, but I'm not going to end on a white question. Um, so y'all figure something out. Uh, I'll rock, paper, scissors, and then we can ask in signing. Um, not to put you on the spot, sorry. It's just, you know, I want to make sure. So you, yeah. I sit down to save time. I don't mind at all. Okay, if you, yeah, if you might, okay, great, we have two. All right. So. What's going on? Is it on? You guys hear me? I can't tell. I can't hear my own voice. It's already in my head. I can't hear you. Sorry. Can you guys hear me now? Now, Are yes. Good? Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, my name is KB. Uh, I'm from Renton, Washington, so I'm from just down the street. Yeah, Renton in the house. Uh, yeah, if you're from Renton, you don't say the T. Um, but I, my question is, I see a lot of things from an educational lens, because I work um, in mm -hmm. education. So um, I actually work at the University of Washington for the Office of Minority Affairs and Diversity. Um, and one of the things that I see that's very prevalent um, in the work that I do as an admissions counselor um, is that we ask a lot of our students to fit into this white system mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. doesn't serve them. Mm -hmm. um, and if they ever go against that, then it takes away opportunities for them. Um, so it puts them in this weird space where if they don't act white, then they can't get to the things that allow them to change and bring those opportunities back to their community. Um, but if they do, then the community sometimes will turn on them and feel like they are betraying their own people. Um, so I wanted to know if there was a way that you feel like, because I went through this myself, like I'm yeah. from, from Ritten, um, went to the University of Washington myself, um, but a lot of that, when I grew up, I had a lot of friends, like my best friend didn't go to college, and he saw me as, you know, that smart guy that went there, but like we lost touch. Yeah. Um, and we came back together later, but it was after, you know, a lot of growth and understanding. Um, so do you have any strategies of what students can do to kind of, educationally code switch? Yeah. Um, I would say, first and foremost, I would say talking more to parents than students. I think it's really important to recognize that as parents of any race, um, if you're not bringing up issues of systemic racism in schools, you are letting your children down. I don't care if your children are white, black, or brown. They are not getting a full education if they're getting a white supremacist education. And the truth is, is that this burden is placed on students of color to master white supremacy if they want to get ahead because the vast majority of white Americans think that victory lies there. They think that it is a valid educational system, a system that erases and degrades and sucks the life out of students of color, they think is valid. They think it's the gold standard, and that's where the core issue lies. Of course, communities of color are going to feel some sort of way, right? When, you know, and even for students who go all the way through, I see what that takes out of them. I, I, know, I talk to academics of color all the time, and the ways in which they're constantly sacrificing themselves, that burden has been placed on us because White America has decided they are completely fine with a white supremacist educational system. And that's what needs to change. What I would tell students of color to recognize is that, A, you, you got to do what you feel like you have to do. Don't feel guilty <laughs> if you're not fighting, because so many students of color feel guilt that they're not battling every single thing. And two, I always tell them, 
recognize, especially like as you're entering high school and college, that you have every right to demand that all of your teachers and your friends who say they care about these issues have to show their work. And this is a great time to start flexing that. And flex it in, I would say one of the, I don't want to say smarter, but more efficient ways, effective ways to flex it is by going to your professors that love to talk about how they are right on this and saying, okay, well, this is what it looks like to be right on this. Going to your friends that say they care about these issues and college students love to care about these issues and say this is what it looks like. It looks like you as a white classmate asking why there aren't more people of color in these texts, right? Start looking at that and recognize you have every right to feel displaced, to feel angry, to feel erased, to feel overburdened, and that it, but that you shouldn't be the only one. <laughs> and that's what I, I hope we recognize that A, first and foremost, parents need to start taking this on. And I'm talking about white parents, because that's who schools are afraid of. White parents need to start taking this on. <laughs> no, one, no one wants a white parent in their office. It's, no one wants a white parent in that office. <laughs> Schools are afraid of white parents. That's if, when I tell people to flex their privilege, flex that privilege for students of color in your school. Start asking about textbooks, start asking about study guides, start asking about the disciplinary actions in school. Start asking about whether or not the expectations on students are fundamentally white supremacists. Start asking these questions, you know, instead of freaking out, when you know, they change the menu and your kid doesn't like the milk being offered anymore, <laughs> freak out about the ways in which students of color are being erased and degraded every day, and you'll start to see real difference. Okay, hi. Um, thank you for being here. And I just want to acknowledge the person that was next to me that was wanting to ask a question about reparations. So clearly we have a lot oh, of ground and, to and cover. And if you have that question still, um, I will try to remember you. And if you want to come up to me at signing and ask it, I'll make time for you. Thank you for that. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of heaviness in the room, um, clearly. And I... Um, I do work in social justice in kind of non-traditional ways. I also work at, um, in transportation for the city as well, I know, um, at Belen. Um, and um, I also volunteer my time on, uh, I used to anyway, on the board of a um, youth nonprofit um, that's based in Columbia City and their predominant uh, audience are uh, communities in the South Side. Um, black and brown folks. And so, you know, faced with all this adversity, I mean, not just myself, but like as um, black indigenous people of color, how do you, what gives you power? What gives you power in this line of work? Um, what gives me power, honestly, a couple of things. One, I'm, I'm a parent and seeing children how quickly they're grasping a lot of these concepts, how fierce they are in their own protection and advocacy gives me so much hope and power. And my drive to protect that for them really keeps me going. Um, I try to, what I try to remind people, what I try to remind myself, what I always try to say is you are more important than white supremacy. And I say that because I think it's very easy for us to lose track of what we're fighting for and instead constantly focus on what we're fighting against. But what we're fighting for is freedom and liberation and joy. Um, and if I keep my focus on that and I find where it's existing in spite of everything, that's an immense sense of power, right? To look at what our community is, where we've, we've found joy over and over and over again, even in the hardest, darkest times to be honored with that heritage and with the task of protecting that. Oh, so powerful, right? Um, and that really keeps me going and I have to always kind of remind myself to go back into that well and spend time in that and protect it in myself 
And if I don't, no one, I don't want any, any person of color to martyr themselves to white supremacy. That is a loss. A single person of color is more important than the entire white supremacist system. And if we don't get through this intact, we will have lost. And that's really remembering how we've renewed ourselves over and over again, how we have reaffirmed our humanity when everyone has tried to take it away over and over again. And just looking at like, you know, I'll watch YouTube videos of like black babies just giggling. And to know that our babies still giggle and we get to enjoy that and protect that, like, that will keep me going forever. I will never feel like it's not worth it because I fundamentally believe in the inherent value of every single person of color. And that means that even if we lose so many battles, one victory is worth it. And that just keeps me going. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.